Turn to Revelation, the ninth chapter, please. The day of the locust. The prophetic message. The day of the locust. Revelation 9. Please turn off your telephones. We appreciate it. The day of the locust. Now, let's start reading until I stop. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven into the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there rose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth. And upon them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power. It was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. In those days shall men seek death and not be able to find it, and shall desire death, and death shall flee from them. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. The heads were as, the crown, were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. They had hair as the hair of women. Their teeth were as the teeth of lions. They had breastplates as were breastplates of iron. The sound of the wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. They had tails like scorpions, and they were sting. there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name was Apollyon. Heavenly Father, we are living in the day of the locust. Everything that you tell us in the word is applied to this day. Lord, what, how up-to-date your word is. We can learn what's happening today by simply going to your word. And Father, I want you to speak to us plainly today. Lord, so that we understand. We will not be left in confusion about this day and all of the things that are happening before our very eyes. Now, Lord, give me the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Let me speak what you have put on my heart. And Lord, let this message be heard around the world, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In Revelation, the 8th chapter, uh, don't turn there, but we have seven angels sounding off seven trumpets and warning of calamities that are coming upon the earth. The first four in the 8th chapter, the first four angels had to do with pollution of one-third of all the earth's trees and grass, pollution of the rivers and the seas, the waters predicted would become bitter, and there would be a pollution of the skies, darkening of one-third of the earth because of pollution. It's all about pollution. It's there. You can read it when you go home this afternoon. But then in the ninth chapter, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And here is the fifth warning. The fifth angel comes to sound a trumpet about that which is soon to happen on the face of the earth. A warning to all of mankind. Prepare a worldwide invasion of locust is coming. A worldwide invasion of locust is at hand. Satan is the star that fell from heaven. And he's going to be given permission to open the gates of hell and release an army of demonic locusts. Now, as soon as the devil opens the bottomless pit, huge billows of smoke pour out, and out of that smoke comes forth an army of demonic locusts. And the Bible says, so widespread that it hides the sun and the air becomes dark and oppressive. And out of the smoke, verse 3, there came locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, these are not locusts, as we know the locust animal. This locust army is an army of men. 
This is a human army. The Bible says their faces were as men, verse 7. They had long hair. They had hair as the hair of women, verse 8. They had a headdress or turban. On their heads were his crowns. They came to torment, to strike terror. Verse 5, like the sting of a scorpion. They are tormentors. They are torturers. The word scorpion actually means poison in the tail or poison. They are poisoners. They are called here as men of war, like horses prepared for battle. The picture is an army of men, tormentors, who are itching like prancing horses wanting to get into the battle, wanting a fight, waiting and ready for the fight. They had wings. In other words, they could sting from the air as well as from the ground. Every one of them had a stinger, a tail, meaning that every one of them possessed the power and the possibility to sting and to hurt men on the face of the earth. Now, friends, this is a real army. This is a human army. This is not a mystical allegory. This, this is a human army that is to be released in the last days. In the last days, an angry devil is going to come down. He's going to be given permission, the keys of hell, and he's going to open the gates of hell, and out is going to come a smoke. And out of the smoke will come this army. It's going to flood the whole earth. Demon-driven fanatics, bringing destruction and fear upon the whole world. Now, folks, numbers of writers and theologians, including the, many of the Puritans, from the 17th century to this very day, believe this is the Mohammedan army. This is Islam. This turbaned army of tormentors is going to be released from the pits of hell in the last day. In fact, if you read later on in this very chapter, it ends up in one third of the earth's population being destroyed by a 200 million man army. A well-known writer of quite a few years ago, Dr. Wordsworth, worked out this whole scenario in a book about Islam and Muhammad. He depicted the smoke coming out of the pit as the doctrine or the religion of Islam. And out of this smoke, which he believed, blinded the eyes of man and covered their eyes and their whole nations so that they could not discern truth and he said, out of this doctrine, out of Islam, will come an army. And he believes very clearly, and many, many did for centuries, that this was the Mohammedan army. Mohammed came out of the 6th century, and with his vicious army, ravaged nations. The smoke, out of the smoke came this, this belligerent army. Mohammed appealed, appeared, I said, in the 6th century. He founded Islam, and with a great army of horsemen, he swept over much of the earth. Now, when I hear it said that Islam is a, a religion of peace, everything in history cries out against that. That is not so. It is not a religion of peace. It's a matter of this. It's a religion of the sword and of war from the very beginning. It was born in violence. And today, most of the battles, almost every war but two that I could name, are wars between Islam and the nations. Islam is behind the wars all over the face of the earth. It has been that from many years from the 6th century. Mohammed, had, Mohammed struck against the Roman and Greek Catholic Church. It struck out in the 6th century against all Jews. It took in about, it, it took in most of Asia, from Euphrates to Constantinople. It captured the Holy Land, all of Asia Minor. Asia Minor. Islam included, it took in all the territory of the seven churches of Asia. It crossed the Bosphorus and the Balkan Mountains to the very gates of Vienna. They took Greece. In all the eastern Mediterranean islands, they captured North Africa. They crossed over the Straits of Gibraltar. 
They founded the kingdom, a kingdom in Spain, and they entered into France ready to conquer France, and they suffered a horrible defeat at Tours. And it stopped this flood that was sweeping over Europe. Islam is today what it has always been, a religion not of love, but of the sword. Even today, the mullahs and ayatollahs, in order to enforce their religious standards, chop off heads, chop off arms, chop off fingers. It's been a bloody religion. Always has and always will be. It is not a religion of peace. Now, let me tell you this. And I want you to listen very closely. It's almost impossible to find a Muslim. Now, let me tell you, Islam is the religion. Muslim, because they were followers of Muhammad. Muslim is more of an American term. Uh, it started by uh, writers and also by Farrakhan. Muslim. They're Mohammedans. They're Mohammedans. Now, I want you to know that I believe God loves Mohammedans just as much as he loves Jews or Gentiles. He loves all men equally. God has a love. And we are to pray for the Mohammedans. First of all, pray that some of their leaders will be saved like Saul of Tarsus and become a mighty missionary to the Muslim nations. To Muslim nations. This church prays for Muslims. We pray. We have the love of God in our hearts for all mankind. But I, you will not find a Muslim very seldom. You will have to look very long and hard to find a single Muslim on the face of the earth who believes that Israel has a right to survive. There is something inborn in the very nature of the Islamic religion, and it's inculcated into the Islamic people, into the Muslims, that Israel, you see, they, they can cry out against terrorism here in the United States. But you mention Israel, kill the Jew. That's a holy jihad. That's a holy war, sanctioned. Now, this is amazing. Now, let me tell you what a terrorist is. A terrorist is not just one who slams his stinger into the World Trade Center. A terrorist is not somebody who blows up people in a gas station or in a pizza parlor. A terrorist is one who has a heart. No, he lifts a finger. He secretly rejoices when the Jew is terrorized. Or killed. Now, well, folks, get this in your mind, please. Understand it. Millions of Muslims, of Muslims all over the world, not only in Pakistan and Afghanistan, but in Iran and in Iraq, millions and millions now of Islamics are rejoicing, and Osama bin Laden is their hero. They're applauding. Now, folks, this is not a political message. It's not a racist message. It's the do God has no problem with Muslims. He has a problem with the doctrine. It's the religion. The locusts, the scripture said, were given a limited time to do their tormenting work. Five months to torment, verse 9. To torment is the torment of a scorpion. Now, all that means they have a limited circumscribed time to do their work. They, they were given permission to torment, but they could not kill a nation. They could not destroy a nation. Folks, Islam is not going to destroy the United States. Terrorists from the Islamic nations will never destroy America. They're given a limited time. Now, five months just means a limited time they were given to do their tormenting work. Now, folks, we had better be prepared for ongoing calamities here in the United States. But I think God may be giving us a warning as to how the scorpions will sting again. The Bible said there's poison. Scorpion means poison tail. We have an anthrax scare right now here in the city and in Florida and throughout the United States because... You know, Iraq has been stockpiling anthrax for years and, and all kinds of chemical weapons. And you can be sure over the past five years they've been stockpiling it here in the United States and many nations on earth. They've been stockpiling it. No doubt even now 
they were waiting for the word for jihad to begin. Now that's a real threat. The locusts are swarming, the Bible says, but the Bible said they are limited in what they can do. They cannot destroy America. They cannot destroy any other nation. Now, God has them circumscribed. You say, well, why would God permit these locusts to terrorize even for a limited time? Jesus himself answered that question. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That word temptation means a time of exam, an hour of trial, an hour to prove. The word try here in Greek is to test, an hour of testing, an hour of trial, an hour of examination. God is allowing all mankind to be put to a test. Let me tell you that the second world is being tested right now. Here in the United States, we've become a secular nation. And the United States, its president, its government, and all of its people are being tested. Whether or not in this hour, when the locusts are swarming, when they're coming with their stingers, and folks coming with their poisons, that may not, that may no doubt be the key to what is about to happen. I don't know. We're not to live in fear. But you see, the second world is being tested. In this time, will you even acknowledge that you need God? America, will you even acknowledge? Rather than give him lip service, will you ask God? Will you even Consider, we even mention it, that without God, we can't prosper in war or in peace. Are you even going to consider the name of the Lord? Or will you allow pride to enter your heart and trust in your military might? Will you trust? This is the test right now for this nation. This is the test for the second world. And God will test the world as well. He said all men are going to be tested. And folks, we're being tested right now. And I want you to know something, folks. I told this Pastor Carter before the service. This is something Holy Spirit made very real to me. You look at the biblical pattern and you look at the pattern in history. When God comes and sends wake-up calls to a nation, if they don't hear the first time, he may do it the second time, but if the second time, and the second time is usually worse than the first, more severe, if they will not then, there, there is no record I can find anywhere of a nation ever repenting after that. Because he that's often reproved hardens his heart. I don't see evidence that the United States has turned their hearts completely to God in leadership, as far as Congress is concerned, I don't see it. I don't hear it. I don't hear this nation passing this test other than giving him lip service and then giving our confidence to our generals and to our high technology and to our bombs and to our armies. God bless our, our soldiers. We need to pray for them and protect them, their own, our own sons and our own daughters. But folks, we're not to put our confidence in the flesh. Some of you are not liking this already. The terrorists, the Islamics are on trial. Because you see, if, if, if they touch Israel, if they talk peace and continue in their bloody ways of terrorism, folks, it's not just a handful of terrorists. It's the whole attitude of the religion against Israel. It's all right to terrorize Israel, but to complain about America being terrorized. They're on trial and they will be exposed. Jesus, God says, I'll expose you here on earth as well as before the judgment seat of Christ on judgment day. But the church of Jesus Christ is the real testing ground even now. No other people on the face of the earth are going to be tested as we're being tested and will be tested. 
And what is the test? What is the exam that the church of Jesus Christ faces? What, what is the, the test that we face? Listen very closely, folks. It's the test whether or not we will trust our God. Whether we will walk in faith. And here's the test, and I want you to listen closely to me, please. Very, very important. When the locusts are terrorizing the nations, when fear is on all sides, the economy is shaking, the world situation worsens, when jobs are being threatened, when evil reports are growing worse and worse, is God going to find a people at rest? Is God going to have a people totally wrapped in his arms, unafraid? Are we going to be trusting him no matter how dark it gets? Do we trust him to only a certain point when there may be uh, just a shade of darkness and we trust him? But as it goes darker, do, do we begin to wane in our faith? Do we say, where is our God in all of this? Or do we trust Him with everything within us? Do we commit ourselves to Him where, when everything else around us is, corrupt, is collapsing? When people all around us are living in fear and despair? Will God have a people on the face of the earth? Will God have a people in this nation that are at rest and at peace in their soul and be able to sing, All is well with my soul? Will God have a people trusting Him in this hour? Jesus said, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. You see, God's focus right now is not on Islam. God listens to the railing of, of these terrorists and he laughs in their face. Nothing they say, nothing they do can hinder the purposes of God on this earth. For his purposes for the church of Jesus Christ or for the salvation of the lost around the world. Nothing they do can hinder his purposes here. Nothing. So God's not concerned about Islam. He's not concerned about it what, uh, whatsoever, except the purpose of him allowing it to become a rod for this testing time. You see, his focus is on his own people, his own body on earth. Will he find us at the end growing in faith or wavering in our faith? And that's his concern. Now see, the, the locust were limited in their ability to kill and destroy nations and they were given a prescribed time in which they could work but there was another restriction put upon this demonic horde that comes out of hell verse 4 it was commanded then that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any what kind of thing green thing neither any tree but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. Now let me tell you how I came about this message. All week, but on my face, oh God, I want to go Sunday morning. And I want to go to the people with an encouraging word. I, I want to lift up and build up the faith of the people. And I want something from your heart. And I struggled all week. I even went through my book I released a, a few years ago. God's plan to protect his people through the coming depression. That book came out. I, I, I got more abuse over that probably than any book I've put out. But I read through it and I, there were 11 messages. I preached from this pulpit on comfort and on help and what God's plan to protect and keep his people. And I said, oh God, I've been, I've been all through the word. I've I've preached that Pastor Carter's preached the reason and, and, and Pastor Neil, those have been in this pulpit. And uh, Pastor Patrick, and there's been a lot of encouragement come forth. And I said, oh, Lord, in, in view of all that I see coming, in fact, what I hear in prayer, I share with Brother Carter before the service, what I hear in prayer, God's saying to me every time on my face, seeking God, is David... You won't bring yourself, you couldn't bring yourself to even believe what is coming. You wouldn't believe it if it were told you. I said, Lord, please don't tell me. <laughs> but I said, Lord, 
a simple mess. I need help for my own soul. I need something from your word. God, it's your word. A comfort, the Holy Ghost makes something real to my word. God gave me these two words, stay green. Green in it, both Hebrew and Greek is healthy, flourishing, bearing fruit. Out in the farm, the, the trees that are attacked are those that are unhealthy. The healthy trees are not attacked by the bugs. They have a life force flowing through them. And it was commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any, green, any tree, green tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. You know what David said? David said, but I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. He said, I trust in God and that makes me green. My health comes from trusting God. I flourish because I trust in God. It's not just the hours I spend in prayer. It's not just the hours I'm hearing the word of God. It's not the good things I do for the cause of the Lord. It's because I trust him and that's producing life in me. Go to Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, please. Seventeenth chapter of Jeremiah. Verses five and six. Thus saith the Lord. Read this if you have the King James. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. All right, I'll read the rest. And he, for he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Cursed is the man or the nation that trusteth in flesh. And folks, when those Mohammedan Islamic terrorists stuck their stinger in the World Trade Center, towers. We were given an opportunity here in the United States to humble ourselves before God. We received a wake-up call, and God called us to acknowledge Him, that we need Him, that we can't, we can't win any war, we can't make any progress without Him. And you see, here's my point. If we trust in our armies, you see, uh, the night that uh, President Bush Sr. sent our troops into the war in I Iraq, he spent the night with Billy Graham on his knees. You see, what really concerned me when we came, when it was all over, and God, God answered prayer, God gave victory. But you see, there was a parade down, a big ticker tape parade down lower Manhattan. And there was not a mention of God, but we gave a ticker tape parade to our generals. Do you remember that? And now, we say, we're going to do it. We have the power. We have the ability. Oh, my God, help us. Help us. We were given an opportunity to humble ourselves. You see, we have it written on our coins in God we trust, but it's not written in our hearts. God, help us if pride takes over. We trust in technology and now our new super bombs and our secret weapons. God, help us. God said, trust not in man, because if you trust in man, you trust in man's power, you trust in man's ability, you're cursed with a curse. And he names the curse what's going to happen. He says, you'll be diminished as the heath in the desert. You won't be the tall tree that's over and above all the trees in the forest. You'll be cut down as nothing but an isolated 
shrub in a desert, abandoned by your friends, abandoned by nations, isolated, finally, all alone, nothing more to be proud about, nothing to boast of, humbled and tarnished. God said that's the curse that comes from trusting in the arm of flesh and not trusting in the arm of God. But blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, verse 7, who trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be. Now, this is what it says. Here's what he's going to become. You trust the Lord and here's what you become. Look at it, please. 17th chapter, verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as. In other words, he's going to come out looking like this. This is what it's going to produce. He shall become a tree that spreadeth out of roots by the river and shall not see when he comes. Her leaves shall be what? Green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding free fruit. Folks, look at me, please. Blessed is the child of God. Blessed is the church of Jesus Christ. Blessed is Times Square Church if they put all their trust in the living God and let no evil report remove them from this place of rest in Him. There is a rest that belongs to the children of God. And He said, you claim that you come into my rest and you will be a green tree when everything around you is dying, everything around you is fading, and there is all of this decay. You will stand healthy and strong and flourish in the Lord. You will be a green tree. You will be as a green tree. You will not languish. It means you will not wilt in the time of trial. Don't turn there, but in Hosea, the 9th, 14th chapter, Ephraim, which represents Israel, had been called back to repentance, and they had obeyed that call, and they returned to their trust in the Lord. And as soon as Ephraim returned to their trust and began trusting the Lord, here's what is said, God speaking. I have accepted Ephraim, and I will make him now to flourish. Like a green fir tree, from me is thy fruit supplied. He said, you begin to trust me and you become healthy. Folks, the best defense against the locust and every sting of the terrorist and the scorpion, the best defense of all is to grow healthy by trusting and every day growing in confidence and resting in God's promises and His faithfulness to keep His people in hard times. Hallelujah. Let me ask you, do you trust in His forgiveness? Do you trust in the cleansing blood? Do you really trust? Or are you still digging up? Are you still digging up old sins that have been long forgiven? Folks, we're talking about trusting God. You, God has to have a people in these last days. You, you, things have changed. They're not like they were before September 11th. Everything has changed and it's going to keep changing. You see, before September 11th, people were talking about how, whether or not that they were satisfied with their jobs. They were talking about psychosis. They were talking about going to their psychiatrist. And they were trying to find somebody that were divorcing because they were looking for somebody who understood them. That's all changed. And now, Church of Jesus Christ, you've got to walk a different path. You and I have to have this confidence. I believe in the new covenant promises of God. I believe that I'm forgiven. My sins are under the blood. And I'll not let the devil do what he can to secular society. He can't touch my soul. I trust in God. I've confessed my sins. They're under the blood. And I'm going to walk in freedom. That's where your confidence begins. Don't let the devil dig up the past. Don't even let him dig up yesterday. If you've come to the blood, believe in the cleansing power. I'm not trusting in the arm of the flesh. I'm not trusting my condemnation, my guilt, my fear. I'm trusting what God said in His Word. I'm under the blood. I'm clean. I'm, pre I'm precious in His sight. Do you trust the unconditional love of God for you? Do you believe that God loves you unconditionally? He doesn't cut you off just because you fail. He doesn't stand behind you waiting till you get it right. You come to Him and simply confess, saying, God, I believe your word. 
hold me. You don't have to live with condemnation, guilt, and fear. There's enough guilt going around. There's enough grief. You don't need condemnation and fear and guilt on top of your grief. Lay it all down. Come to the unconditional love of God through Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. God wants to be your friend. I, I, I read the story, uh, Dr. Malcolm Smith, an acquaintance of mine, has written a book on the covenant. And I was reading his manuscript. And there's a story there of a man who came to his meeting. He was from Brazil. And he had a good job. He gave up his job and a wife and two children. And he felt the call of God and his missions department sent him up into the, uh, up into the Brazilian jungles. And there, at a hard time, terrible time. And uh, he watched as his family was near starving. And his denomination failed to send the support they promised to send him. And in his despair, he said, I, he told his wife, I'm going back to Rio de Janeiro, going back to the city, back to my good paying job. And uh, he, he said, you pack while I go out in the woods and pray. And while his wife was packing, he went out for a few days in a little, little cabin and he was in the cabin. Three days just pouring his heart out to God saying, God, how can you let me starve? How do you let all these terrible things happen in my life? And the Holy Spirit came into that room the third day. I believe it was the third day. And here's what he heard from the Holy Spirit. Kind, loving words. If you want to go back, you go back. Because if you can be my friend better in Rio de Janeiro than up here, I don't want to lose your friendship. Now think of that. If that's what it takes to hold you as my friend, I love you. And if I'm not against it, you can go back. But don't give up being my friend. And folks, in these days, God is our friend. We have a friend in Jesus. We have a friend in our Heavenly Father who wants to live, wants to live without guilt and fear and condemnation and trust in the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Don't you dare let the devil bring up something you did even yesterday. If you've repented tonight or yet last night, keep it under the blood. And, and this battle that you're in, God said he'll give you the Holy Ghost and give you power and he's going to see you through it. He's going to bring you through to victory. So trust in the unconditional love of God and that he's your friend. Not only was Abraham a friend of God, I'm a friend of God. <clears throat> I was at our, the farm this past week praying and walking down the road and just rejoicing in the Lord. And I was singing, it is well with my soul, it is well. And I said, Lord, do you have a word for me? <laughs> and he whispered to Mark, yes, I do. Because you've humbled yourself, you seek my face, and because you trust me. All heaven is singing, David, it is well with you. It is well with you. And when you hear that from heaven, you become green. Oh, I have a lot of stuff, but I'm going to ignore it. I'm just not going to go any further because I, I want you to stand and turn to Psalm 20. This is a... You know what this is. Sister Teresa wrote a song about it. Twentieth chapter. Now, let's read the whole chapter. Do you have it out? Glory to God. This will turn you green. Somebody's going to walk out here saying, uh, 
turn Times Square Church, all the people have turned green. <laughs> That's a compliment. That's a compliment. Coming healthy. Glory to God. God wants you to be healthy and strong in His Word. Let's, let's read it together. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice, Salah. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know I am that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with his saving strength in his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Save Lord, let the King hear us when we call. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Raise your hands and just tell him you love him. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. We call upon our God. We rise up in faith. Hallelujah. Lord, we don't trust in chariots. We don't trust in armies. We pray for our armies. We thank God that they're there. But, oh, God, we trust that only you can direct them. Only you can direct them. Only you can give them victory, Lord. Only you can do that. We call upon the name of the Lord with thanksgiving and praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I received a very loving word from the Lord in my heart. For those in the annex and those here in the main auditorium, <clears throat> today, today, God wants a number of you, the Lord, by His Spirit, there are a number of you here now, that every time you see these things, that, that grief continues, and every time you see these things coming, there's a sense in you that things are not right between you and the Lord. Just not right. Maybe you've drifted away from the Lord. Maybe you've allowed uh, a, a, a particular besetting sin to overpower you. And, and maybe you're living in, 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 a, in, a, in a place that's not pleasing to the Lord. You know that. And the Lord would like you to respond to a loving call. So when you walk out of here, your life is changed. You don't say, well, I was scared into it. No, just open arms of the loving Jesus. The, the Lord just loving you. Saying, I'm not mad at you, but I want to lift you out of this. I want to bring you out of this, and I want to strengthen you. And I want to really give this flourishing green life that we're talking about. Like in, in uh, room 206, you that are in 206 there, if you want to stay and pray, the invitation I'm giving right now, you just stay right there, and you can get on your knees. But I'd like the rest, if you will, just uh, vacate that room so we can fill it up with seekers. And as soon as that room is vacated, except for those who want to stay and pray, those in the annex uh, and all the overflow rooms, if you feel that this is not a time uh, to be uh, flippant about your spiritual welfare, you talk about uh, fear, folks, the fear is going to spread so wide. But you don't have to live in that fear. Because God wants it to be all well with your soul. He wants you to leave here knowing that it's all well. You can walk out of here no matter what happens. You can sing, it is well with my soul. And nobody was pushing you or threatening you. It's because God's love, as seldom before you've experienced, has come to you now and saying, today, let me embrace you. Come on, I'm waiting for you. Not angry at you, not mad at you. I want to bring you back. Don't run anymore. And you talk to God. You say, Lord, here I am. Put in me what I need to see me through. Lord, I accept your love. And let the Lord, if you just, if you just look up and just tell him how much you love him, how much you need him. Say, Lord, I need here. I give you everything. I surrender everything. I do that in my secret closet of prayer every day. I said, Lord, I surrender. I give you my body even as a living sacrifice. Here in the main auditorium, uh, up in the balcony, and here in the main floor, if you, if you feel that same thing and there's a tug and pull at your heart and the Holy Spirit's here, you just get out of your seat and come and stand here. And just open up your heart to Jesus. 
He'll embrace you, and you'll be able to walk here saying, It is well with my soul. There's, and every report that you hear, nothing will phase you. Nothing will upset you. Oh, folks, we get calls from, from, from even backslidden preachers who, who just, they're in terror. God doesn't want you to be in terror. When things are right with God, nothing, no evil report can touch you or harm you. But that's not why you need to come. You need to come because the Lord has given you the most loving invitation you've ever received in your life. You know when you know the Holy Spirit's there? It's just a little tug, a little pull at your heart. And the Lord said, today's your day. You're among a family of believers who love you. And uh, I don't know how to make the Lord more lovable than he is. All we have to give him is our sacrifice of our lips. But all I can feel his love. This is the conclusion of the message. 